I'd like to uh, welcome everyone. My name is Adam Hirschfelder. I am the Director of Strategic Initiatives here at the California Historical Society. And uh, for the past year, I've had the wonderful pleasure of helping lead the California Historical Society's efforts celebrating the centennial of the Panama Pacific International Exposition. And uh, what's great is I've seen, uh, I see some familiar faces here. Many people have come uh, to a lot of our programs. I believe this is either the eighth or ninth program we've done looking at different aspects of PPIE. Uh, and one we've all been looking forward to uh, for a good part of the year. Uh, as you may know, the efforts that CHS has done regarding PPIE not only involves our own organization and our exhibit here, which you've gotten a chance to look at, but also an exhibit we've done uh, up at the Palace of Fine Arts, which for those who know the farewell is the one remaining building from the fair. Uh, but we've had the honor to work with now over 60 different organizations looking at different aspects of the centennial, and though uh, the fair ended in 1915 on December 4th, uh, we like to think we're in one of the most exciting periods of the entire year with the centennial, with the amount of different organizations doing things, including a few weeks ago, of course, the opening of the de Young's exhibit looking at art that originally hung in the Palace of Fine Arts. But tonight we are looking not at the art of the fair, but food at the fair. And we are here with one of our uh, longtime collaborators, uh, Erica Peters, uh, from the Culinary Historians of Northern California, who we have done uh, several programs with. And it is great to uh, have you here, Erica, and I will introduce you in a second. But uh, um, <clears throat> um, really quickly wanted to thank uh, a couple uh, key organizations that have made tonight possible, as well as the Centennial. First, from the Henry Mayall Newhall Foundation, which has helped support all of the programmings the California Historical Society has done related to PPIE. We thank them. And a special thanks tonight, and I think you'll see at the end, uh, from our friends from Ghirardelli Chocolate Company, um, who not only had a presence at PPIE 100 years ago, uh, but have celebrated the centennial this year at their chocolate festival uh, last month and tonight, I think, are providing uh, chocolate for, uh, for folks at the end. So, so thank you, Ghirardelli. Thank you, Henry Neon. New Health Foundation, and thank you all for being here. Uh, I'm going to introduce uh, Erica Peters, a longtime friend of the California Historical Society. Uh, she helped found the organization in 2004. She is the author of Appetites and Aspirations in Vietnam, Food and Drink in the Long 19th Century, and more recently, where we know her well, San Francisco, a food biography, one of our favorite books here at the California Historical Society. And in January, she'll be teaching a course on local food history for the new MA program in food studies at the University of the Pacific at the new campus, which is just a few blocks away. So if you've not registered or applied for the MA program, we encourage you to do so. So uh, thank you all for being here. We have one more program here at the California Historical Society related to the centennial. We'll be looking at the stories of five women, five significant women at PPIE, and that will happen on December 3rd here at CHS. On the night of December 4th, we'll also uh, be having a fun night down at the Ferry Building as we turn off the 1915 lights that many people have seen. Uh, and we'll be doing things uh, throughout the city and other organizations until the end of the year. You can find out uh, everything that's going on with the Centennial at ppie100.org. So with that, I will uh, turn it over to our friend, uh, Erica Peters, who will talk about tonight's program and introduce all the speakers. So thank you very much for being here. Thank you, thank you, Adam. Um, and I want to thank also Kathy and Patty and Michaela who helped put this all together. Um, thank you all for coming. Uh, I believe Patty is going to be handing out cards and pencils so that if people have questions as the program goes on, uh, just write it on a card so you don't forget what your question was and then they'll be collected and, and asked at the end. I will introduce the panelists, but I'm going to introduce them um, as they speak so that you know who's speaking rather than all at once right now. Um, so I will go straight into... Mine, if, there we go, there's me. Um, so I got really interested in the 1915 fair while doing research for that book on San Francisco's food history. I'm gonna present 
I'm going to present about the overall tourist experience of coming to San Francisco to see the fair and experiencing the city as a food destination when they arrived. So people didn't come to San Francisco just to see the fair. They were also really interested in the opportunity to see San Francisco, this famous cosmopolitan city. The city had so many different cuisines and such disparities of wealth even back then. We think our times are bad, but they also, coming out of the gold rush and then the, the second wave of mining wealth with the Comstock load in the late 19th century. So this is the glamorous Poodle Dog French restaurant at the turn of the 20th century. So this is not from 1915. I'm setting it up with what was here before the earthquake and fire. Um, this is where the, the uh, people with a lot of money went to spend that money and to show off that they had done very well in uh, San Francisco of the Gilded Age. And there were rooms upstairs where you might take your mistress as well. It was a little bit... The French restaurants were considered... Um, uh, a little uh, um, risque. risque, thank you. Uh, the less glamorous and more bohemian crowd would gather at Kappa's. Um, the owner, Giuseppe Kappa, had trained in Paris and he actually cooked at the Poodle Dog before he opened his own uh, more Italian bohemian joint. The food there was cheap, unlike at the Poodle Dog, and, um, but also it was very good. Pasta, seafood, salads, and plenty of red wine. Um, Oh, do I have the pointer? We can see the red wine. And um, Coppa encouraged his artist friends to decorate the walls with these crazy murals. And I, I have another image as well, more crazy murals. Um, and a toast, Bohemia's toast. Because um, it, it, you get the feeling that drinking was a big part of the environment there, and maybe some other substances as well. So stories about these places, about Bohemia and San Francisco, uh, had spread across the country, making the city seem like a very exciting place to visit around 1900. And then, of course, 1906, the earthquake and fire hit. This is Kappa's right after. You can see the building uh, next door is really collapsed. Um, not a, even that building, this, the building that looks like it's intact, was not obviously usable. Um, the whole world was gone. Almost all the restaurants were gone. Uh, it was, and the word of that obviously spread across the country too. So people were like, oh, no more San Francisco, too bad, because that sounded like a nice place to visit. Uh, <laughs> so the first thing that the city had to do was convince people to start coming back. Just like after Katrina, you know, in, in our memory, New Orleans had to work hard to, to let everyone know the city was built again and there was a lot of stuff to do and you should come back. The Sa San Francisco had the same situation. So this is one of the postcards that they put out to say that they are going before Congress to get the uh, approval to run the PPIE, which you probably all have, have heard about this process. Um, and in, in 1911, they got the approval that they would have the fair here in San Francisco um, to show the world that San Francisco was back on its feet again, ready to go, and tourists should definitely start coming back and spending money in San Francisco again. So in the, the Chronicle, the San Francisco Chronicle's restaurant reviewer was named Clarence Edwards. And in 1914, he put out this book, a guidebook to the city's restaurants, to help tourists who were coming into San Francisco before and for the fair figure out where they should eat in the city. This was not the only guidebook to San Francisco. There were others. The Chamber of Commerce put one out. There was one um, put out by Ruth Kedzie Woods, Wood called The Tourists California, which was also very popular. But this was one of the most popular books. Um, Guidebooks were needed because there were many, many resources in the rebuilt San Francisco. There were over 2,000 hotels at this point, and, uh, well, 2,000 hotels and rooming houses. And most of those offered some kind of food in their uh, facilities, a uh, dining hall of some kind or a restaurant. And there were an additional 800 um, or so restaurants to choose from. As the restaurant reviewer for the Chronicle, Clarence Edwards went to almost all the restaurants. He was like Michael Bauer of his day. He went to certainly all the best restaurants, and his book was the go-to source on where you should eat. He was there to report when the restaurants started opening again, the famous ones, after the earthquake and fire. Most of the famous ones did. 
um, but some were very different in form. And he tantalized his readers, the people who bought Bohemia in San Francisco, with the idea that they couldn't get access to that real Bohemian San Francisco that was there during the Gilded Age. And that's a recurring concept that, was, that, that tourists who came for the fair had to deal with the fact that the locals kept saying, oh, this is nice, but you should have been here back then. You should have been here before the earthquake and fire. That was the real San Francisco. So there's always this tension that people, obviously they're trying to market the city and they want people to think that the city is just as good as it was before, but people who live here keep saying, oh, it's not quite as good as it was before. So Edwards did uh, sprinkle his book with um, snippets of this is how it used to be, and this is where you can go get a taste, even though the real thing isn't there anymore. Um, so one of these, for instance, is Oyster's Kirkpatrick. He noted that the Palace Hotel's version of this, which was named after Colonel John C. Kirkpatrick, who managed the Palace Hotel from 1894 to 1914, so he was there just until this book was published, um, their version was a lot like a dish that was served at the most famous of the old oyster houses, Manning's, at the corner of Pine and Webb Streets. So Manning's did not come back after the earthquake and fire, but the dish, which was a tasty little combination of oysters and cheese and Worcestershire sauce and bacon baked and then served on the half shell, that was a big hit among tourists who felt like they were getting a taste of the Gilded Age. So that's Victor Hertzler, at the, who was at the, the famous chef at the St. Francis. He is probably the first crazy celebrity chef, at least in America. He was born in Alsace in France, and he trained in Paris. He served as um, cook and food taster for Tsar Nicholas II, and also as chef de cuisine for the King of Portugal before he moved to New York City and started cooking at the, at the Waldorf. In 1904, just before the earthquake and fire, he moved to San Francisco and became head chef for the St. Francis, which had at that point just opened on Union Square. And at least in photos, uh, maybe all the time, he uh, always wore that red fez on his, ha on his head. Sorry, I don't really have a color photo, but um, he was very good at branding. So he was that chef who wears the red fez. Um, he also was very good at inventing dishes and naming them after himself. You've probably heard of Celery Victor. It's not a flashy recipe. It's basically soggy celery. <laughs> it's celery cooked in, in a broth for, for a long time. And the question is, why did Victor think this was delicious? Well, he was from France. And in, no, but I mean, in France, they don't, eat, they don't eat vegetables raw. They never eat vegetables raw. So, but celery was something that Americans did think of as, as a beautiful, they had celery vases in the Gilded Age. There were vases that you would put out on your, as part of the table setting, and there would be beautiful celery stalks coming out of the celery vases. Uh, but then you ate it as, as an appetizer raw. Um, he thought this was atrocious. People should not eat celery raw. So he came up with this elaborate dish um, and it became one of the things that San Francisco was known for. Uh, we're we're going to have some tastings after the program is over, and one of the things that we're going to taste is not celery, Victor, because we were not able to find a way to make it delicious. <laughs> but, <laughs> but Hearts of Palm, Victor, which is another one of his dishes, uh, he liked using local produce. Obviously, his celery would have been local celery, but he had no problem with using canned uh, foods when that was the most appropriate way to get something. Um, so hearts of palm is obviously canned hearts of palm and canned food was considered modern and wonderful in those days, in 1915. Um, and Victor had an opinion on oysters Kirkpatrick as well. In his version it has ketchup mixed in with the Worcestershire sauce. So he's not a reliable source for what we consider tasty, good tasting food, but uh, but he was the best known chef of his era. So that's the cover of a cookbook that was put out as part of the Panama Pacific Exposition, which included all sorts of dishes, some that were San Francisco was famous for, but also just a world of food, because obviously the whole world was coming to the exposition. Um, but what I want to bring out is that when they knew that people were coming to the city for the exposition, they found ways to adapt 
foods that were local to what they thought of as non-sophisticated American tastes and worldwide tastes. Um, so chipino was one of the dishes that actually it didn't go all the way back in San Francisco. It got its start um, around 1900 as far as non-fishermen are concerned. I mean, it came with Italian fishermen from northern Italy as a fish stew that they were used to making with their fresh catch. Um, but the Chronicle did a story in 1901 which called the dish Cispini, but you can still tell it's Cipino. Um, and they give a rough recipe building a sauce out of sweet oil, garlic, fresh tomatoes, chili peppers, and white wine. And then you clean up and cut up your fresh catch and you drop it into the hot sauce and cook it for just three minutes in that hot sauce. The journalist for the Chronicle said, it tastes much better than it sounds. But that suggests that um, she, the journalist, did not think that her readers would have ever had Chipino if she's explaining to them that they should give it a try if they can. By 1915, it had taken off, and seafood restaurants um, across San Francisco all had their own versions of Chipino. But in the PPIE cookbook, they take out the chili peppers. They have paprika instead. And then a similar thing happens with Crab Louie, which was also new to the city. The earliest version we have in print is from 1908. This was fresh Dungeness crab with a creamy, spicy sauce that um, was made with chili peppers. Um, it was actually the first time it was served on that, that menu that we have is at uh, Berger Frank's Old Poodle Dog Restaurant, which was a conglomeration of the best French restaurants from before the earthquake fire, um, all working together to reopen at least one French restaurant that they could bring all their favorite, all, the, all their um, beloved customers back in and give them some uh, familiar French foods. And Louis Coutard was the chef at Frank's in Berger Frank's Old Poodle Dog. Uh, he died in May 1908, and we think that the, um, oh, I have. So that's, that's Berge Frank's old poodle dog. This is the beginning of the menu, the, the opening page of the menu. And then, do I have my button? Crab, crab leg a la Louis special for 50 cents. Um, was probably named after him in memory of their, their friend Louis, who had just died. That was 1908. By 1915, Crab Louie is also widespread across San Francisco, but in the PPIE cookbook, instead of having a one-third mayonnaise to two-thirds chili sauce, it has mayonnaise with ketchup. So uh, again, this is my, my point is that um, they didn't think that the people coming to the fair would necessarily want or be um, would find chili peppers accessible, so they find different ways of adjusting those dishes to make San Francisco's food um, accessible and not intimidating. I'm just gonna quickly go through some of the other restaurants that Edwards mentions. The Cliff House. It actually survived the earthquake and fire, but it burned down in 1907, so it was also new for the fair. Uh, Edwards says you should go out there in the morning for a pot of steaming coffee whose aroma rises like incense to the sea gods. So he's a flowery, writer. The Cliff Cafe, I just love this photo, it's on the same block and that's from around 1915, that photo. Uh, this is the Fior d'Italia, which uh, actually opened in 1886, um, but had revamped in, after the earthquake so that by the time of the fair it could seat 300 people at a time. Uh, and Edwards went on and on about the feast that you could get there for a dollar. The Heidelberg Inn is um, what Edwards called one of the very few real bohemian restaurants of San Francisco. You could find absolute freedom from irksome convention conventionality and none of the near bohemianism of so many places claiming the title. So you get the feeling that people um, wanted to find a certain, what we might call hippies, bohemian culture, and they, he promised them that they would find it there. This is, it's an interesting moment because 1915 is, or 1914 when the book is published, is um, the beginning of World War I, but at this stage we're not in the war and Germans are not yet being seen as, as the enemy here. Though there's a, uh, the 
tagline on the postcard is after the battle. So he's collapsed after his battle with the food, but you get the sense that probably that's also an undertone of battle, Germany, there's an awareness that the war is going on. And then I'm just gonna finish with, uh, with chop suey and tea houses, and uh, actually there were elaborate Chinese restaurants as well, though I don't have a, a picture of them. Um, so Chinatown had been there, obviously, the Chinese came since uh, the gold rush, but uh, it, there was a long period where people didn't go to Chinatown to eat, they felt Chinatown was disgusting, but by the 20th century, that's changed, shop suey restaurants are very popular, uh, and they become one of the things that people who come to San Francisco, especially for the fair, they want to go to Chinatown and experience the, the chop suey restaurants. But something that people don't always know about is that there were a lot of people coming across the Pacific to the fair because the fair obviously was, it was reaching out. It's a Pacific fair. It's reaching out to, um, to Asia as well. And so there were very elegant Chinese restaurants that opened in 1914, 1915, just to welcome the Chinese dignitaries and give them the level of banquet that they were accustomed to. So some Americans went to these banquets and got uh, introduced to a, an even higher level of sophisticated Chinese food than, um, than they had had in San Francisco before that. So um, I will end there and move on to our other speakers. Pam is a founding member of the Culinary Historians of Northern California and has designed online courses for the Culinary Institute of America and published a website for culinary professionals and home cooks. She's also a longtime collector of books on food, wine, and spirits, and an exuberant enthusiast on all research and ephemera related to the PPIE. Welcome, Pam. First of all, I'm going to step back and give a little bit of history even though many of you, I'm sure, have been to many of these events and um, don't need it, but some might. So I think this fair was really phenomenal. And it started uh, <clears throat> with President Theodore Roosevelt. And some of you may have watched the PBS program on Theodore Roosevelt and saw how he fought to get the Panama Canal built and the reason he did is that he, decided, he felt very strongly that uh, the United States could be a leading power in the Western Hemisphere. And he realized the value of easier access to the Americas and the Pacific. So after the French engineers, uh, for years, tried to complete the cut through the Isthmus of Panama um, and, and failed, mainly because of the disease there, um, he... Uh, in 1904, established a commission to oversee its completion. He went down there, got malaria. Um, he really fought it through. And if you get a chance to watch the uh, program about Theodore Roosevelt, uh, that one bit really uh, comes through. Man had tenacity. But no longer would it be necessary to sail around Cape Horn, saving a distance of almost 8,000 miles from New York to California. And the opening of the Panama Canal would facilitate East, West, and Far East trade, and San Francisco would become a primary trading hub for the Western United States. It took 10 years to build, completed in, 19, in 1914, and it ushered in a, a new era of globalization. Young Reuben Hale, some of you may remember Hale Brothers Clothing Stores in San Francisco, um, uh, he believed that when the canal was finished, that San Francisco's economy might benefit greatly if a World's Fair could uh, celebrate the canal's opening. And so Hale and other merchants formed a company to promote the idea, and their efforts were well underway when on April 18, 1906, the great earthquake and subsequent fire leveled much of the city, including the business hub. There really was no other option than to rebuild, and once Reconstruction had begun, to continue that campaign to host a World's Fair. It could help so much to revive the, the economy and put the city back on the map in the world's mind. It turned out to provide, or to end up being the great motivator for the rebirth of San Francisco. 
After San Francisco won the bid to hold the fair, President Taft and the Panama Pacific Company organizers led by tireless Charles Moore, whose picture you'll see many times around the exhibit here tonight. Uh, here they're using a silver shovel to break ground in what is now Golden Gate Park, um, which was thought to be ideal for the site, for the fair. <clears throat> Uh, but soon, the organizers realized the difficulty in shipping goods over what was then mostly sand dunes, so a better site was found. It was Harbor View, or Washerwoman's Cove, which is where the marina district is now. The advantages were that it was more accessible, had excellent views, and shipping and transport for building materials would be much easier than coming directly from the ocean and pulling it over all those sand dunes. Uh, but the site encompassed 76 blocks of 200 parcels of land with 175 separate owners to deal with. And there were over 200 existing buildings that all had to be removed. And it would also require extensive drainage and filling of the wetlands. Eventually, the site would be built from the Presidio to Fort Mason, an area two and a half miles long, by one to one and a half miles wide. It encompassed 635 acres from Van Ness Avenue to the Presidio, Chestnut Street to the Bay. The total cost was $17 million, or with the 2,255% 2, um, inflation since then, uh, it would be about 400 million today. And all the world was invited to assure success and return on local, state, and federal investment, Bay Area residents were encouraged to send postcards to friends and relatives all over the country and the world, um, inviting them to the fair. On this postcard, a young lady wears a Panama hat, of course, and uh, has a welcoming smile. Construction, let's see, there we go. Construction began in earnest and took just two years to complete. And when you think how long it took to build the bridge, <laughs> the new bridge, I, I, this is amazing that they could do it. A hundred million board feet of lumber was used. The framework was covered in a temporary material called staff, which is a mixture of plaster and a burlap type fab fiber that could be molded and sculpted. The only building with a steel frame was the Palace of Fine Arts because the insurers wouldn't allow it to have a wood frame with all that valuable art in it. But at the end of the fair, its strength, that steel frame, and its beauty saved it from destruction. It's the only one that we have left. On opening day, February 20th, 1915, Mayor Rolf held a parade of 150,000 residents and visitors up Van Ness Avenue to the fairgrounds. Those are people, that, that whole sea of little black specks are people. <laughs> um, by the time they reached their destination uh, to the entrance, uh, the, all the parade components and the bands and everything had been completely engulfed. It was only because so many people had purchased tickets in advance that the pay gates were not overwhelmed. At precisely noon, uh, President Wilson pressed a gold telegraph key in Washington, D.C., that sent a signal to an antenna. Whoops, I'm supposed to be back there. Sent a, uh, a signal to an antenna on the Tower of Jewels, and the great doors to the exhibition swung open. Cannons boomed and crowds cheered. And the city's grandest celebration, perhaps ever, I think, began. By the end of the day, more than 250,000 people passed through those turnstiles, equivalent to half the population of San Francisco. Everyone was excited to go to the fair. The city's transportation system had been entirely rebuilt and expanded from one line before the earthquake to a 10-line citywide system that transported visitors quickly and easily to the PPIE. A guidebook was a necessity, and here are just a few. Some were free, like the two at the left from Walgreens Drugs and Rainier Beer. 
The People's Easy Guide on the right had an easy tour outlined, and here it is, shown in red. Most of the official food exhibits were just left of the middle of the map in the Palace of Agriculture and the Palace of Food Products, which is next to the Palace of Fine Arts Lagoon. This so-called easy tour goes through the entire grounds and covers, I estimate, about 10 miles. <laughs> so uh, we can only imagine how tired and hungry a visitor would become after that. Crowds came from all over the state, the country, and the world. And that was because many uh, wealthy Easterners traveled west to San Francisco rather than to Europe because of the Great War. The average daily attendance was 45,580 people. In July, it went up to about 89,000 per day. The Court of the Four Seasons between, um, w lie between the Food Products Palace and the, uh, the Palace of Horticulture. And in the center was the beautiful statue of Ceres, the ancient Roman goddess of agriculture. The Palace of Food Products was nicknamed the Palace of Nibbling Arts. Inside the Palace of Agriculture, visitors were greeted by the state of Iowa's huge cornucopia with a mountain of corn pouring out. Uh, it, it was 45 feet high and 65 feet in diameter at its base, but it was hollow, um, with more exhibits inside that showed the wonderful products that could be made from corn, such as corn sweetener. <laughs> the state of Washington's display was no less dull, except here in the uh, one photo that I could find of it, uh, that shows the huge potatoes that they exhibited. And the shelf on the left there, um, the, the one sort of down on the middle, has some potatoes that I think are, look about as large as a man's shoe. But the highlight of their booth was that its tanks that were filled with all sorts of living fish that were stuffed, uh, that were from all over Washington and the Pacific um, fisheries. They also had stuffed and mounted fish and to promote, um, to promote the fish fisheries. And this was one of the displays, favorite displays of uh, Laura Ingalls Wilder, the author of Little House on the Prairie who, while visiting from Missouri, wrote one of the best first-hand descriptions that, that exists of the um, fair. Canned Washington salmon enabled families to enjoy this delicious fish year-round and without having to keep it chilled in an unreliable icebox. And Jeanette will tell you more about that. The state of New York <clears throat> promoted its dairying with the largest cheese ever made in the United States seven and a half tons of cheddar cheese. Mr. H. A. Reese, seated in the middle, produced it with the help of a team of workers. It was sent across country in its own boxcar, accompanied by Mr. J. S. Searle, shown on the left, who lived in that boxcar and had all his needs met in it. And we can only imagine how very glad he was when he arrived in San Francisco. <laughs> To be awarded a grand prize, a product had to be perfect in every way, an example of the finest kind, of its uh, finest kind in all the world. California's wine industry was well represented and won many medals. The Hawaiian pineapple growers set up a pineapple uh, processing plant at the fair. This was a new and ex very exotic fruit for most visitors. They'd never tasted it. November 10th, 1915, 100 years ago today, was designated Hawaiian Pineapple Day. Canned pineapple was served to President Wilson and all the state's governors on that day, and hotels and cafes throughout the country featured it. And 5,000 cans of pineapple were given away at the fair. And tonight we have some canned pineapple juice for you to try, in case you've never tried it. <laughs> In the Palace of Horticulture, as well as in the popular Hawaiian Pavilion, pineapple and pine pi pineapple juice, as well as Hawaiian coffee, were served in comfortable lounges, while Hawaiian musicians played lovely Hawaiian tunes. The public loved the music, and within a year, Hawaiian music and the ukulele became instantly popular throughout the country. 
Foreign countries promoted their products in the Palace of Agriculture and in their own buildings, eager to trade with the countries opening up to them through the Panama Canal. Here, Argentina shows it's ready to ship all those products. A delicious aroma emanated from the Sperry Flour Company's full-scale flour mill and bakery, where breads from around the world were baked and sold daily. Scones with jam and butter were a most popular snack at the fair. Uh, here and at other exhibitors' booths, as well as at cafes throughout the fairgrounds. And tonight, um, I'm sharing some that were made from Fisher's flour. Uh, I'm, well, Fisher's is now out of business, but it was a, another one of the competing flour companies. And it's from the original recipe, and I've included it there so you can take the recipe home if you'd like. Sperry won a grand prize for its flour, as well as a number of gold medals for other products. The Quaker Oats Company promoted its new puffed rice with an exciting demonstration of its cereal puffer gun, which I wish we had a picture of. Somebody must. Um, it also so sold souvenir boxes of oatmeal cookies, and that box belongs to Glenn Cook, who's a wonderful collector and is here tonight. And it's amazing that it's lasted 100 years, I think. He's taking good care of it. The Carnation Milk Company fed and looked after its herd of contented cows in the fair's livestock area and even built a beautiful, I mean, that is a gorgeous milk condensary plant adjacent to the Palace of Food Products. But it was Borden's who won the grand prize because their condensed milk products were judged the best. Counties exhibited their food products in the California building. Here, Marin, Monterey, and a consortium of eight Central Valley counties display their wares. And then I enlarged that picture of the Monterey County exhibit, and I found that all of those cans contained abalone. Now, uh, in my mind, that surely ruined the delicate taste of the abalone, but moreover, it impacted the species' future survival as well if abalone was promoted and fished or, or taken that much. The California Associated Raisin Company Sun Made Raisin Exhibit demonstrated the clean sanitary process they used to prepare raisins that were untouched by human hands. Sanitation and convenience were common themes among many food produce producers and canners perhaps in response to the public's concern following Upton Sinclair's 1906 novel, The Jungle, which revealed widespread unsanitary practices of the, uh, of the meatpacking industry and dangers in the food, con food supply. Lorraine Col uh, Collette, the original Sun Maid Girl, was first pictured on a box in 1916. Several sun-made maidens are shown in the front row of this panoramic photo of food workers at the Palace of Food Products. It was uh, food workers and, ex and uh, exhibitors. And the original is down now. It's back in that alcove to the right of the stairway. It's the lower photo. And you can see Lorraine in it. The H.J. Heinz Company featured a tower of canned goods, one layer for each of its 57 varieties. Inside, they showed a silent film about their factory's sanitary food processing methods, and they also offered recipe books that showed the ease and convenience of preparing meals year-round from canned foods. The home refrigerator had only been invented two years before, and most people still only had ice boxes which were not completely reliable for keeping foods fresh very long. But not to be outdone, Libby, McNeil and Libby, major meat packers and producers of canned goods, promoted their convenient, sanitary, and healthful products. And these included animal parts that some of us today don't often buy fresh, if ever, uh, let alone canned, such things as tripe, oxtails, pig's feet, and lambs, tongues, and kidneys. Tea rooms and cafes were everywhere. Most offered light meals. It was interesting in the Chinese uh, one at the top right, 
they served American sandwiches. I was really surprised. But there were Chinese restaurants that served Chinese food, some Chinese food, but it was quite Americanized there. Tea rooms, uh, let's see, Ridgeways. An English tea company had an elegant tea room booth in which to relax. And there was fine dining, <clears throat> uh, elegant, more formal dining within the fairgrounds too, at cafes like the Miller Luxus Cafe, the Old Faithful Inn, and at the Inside Inn, where some of the 928 conventions that took place that year were held. I mean, that is an amazing number of conventions. Sorry. Back in the Palace of Food Products, Horlicks promoted malted milk powder and tablets that were sold in pharmacies as a sleep aid to stave off night starvation. <laughs> Mom and pop businesses also exhibited. And below you see a family that's promoting their sanitary candy maker candy although it seems they could have used maybe better signage and a catchier name, I think. Baker's Cocoa, ground and hot, was sold and enjoyed in their cafe, shown on the postcard above. You could also get coffee on the zone uh, and, and snacks and food in the, in the many restaurants. People, uh, many people like to meet one another at MJB's distinctive Y Coffee Parlor. Light lunches and suppers were also served inside the cafe, and on the back of that postcard, the father of August Binderman of Elyria, Ohio, wrote that he had just enjoyed supper with Aunt Pauline while on the zone. This is from Glenn's collection. Driving a tamale wagon around the grounds, as well as exhibiting in the Food Products Palace, was the Workman Packing Company, whose canned IXL tamales were sold and enjoyed by many of us, I have to admit, uh, until the 1960s. They were enormously popular then. They were so convenient. The sign on the horse boasts that IXL sold 2 million tins of tamales, enchiladas, and chili con carne in California the previous year. Now we come to Ghirardelli's and that chocolate. Ghirardelli's pavilion was located at the Fillmore Street entrance to the zone, right at the entrance of the most popular part of the fair. It housed a model chocolate factory where they made chocolate, so you could imagine the aroma, and sold confe confections and hot chocolate, 371,000 cups of it. To build and staff it, it cost Domenico Ghirardelli a little over $100,000 which in today's uh, dollars is two and a half million, just for that. Now across the way, <clears throat> directly across from Ghirardelli's, was Welch's Pavilion. The pair formed an elegant entrance to the zone. Grape juice was very popular too. It had been introduced at the Columbian Exhibition, the Chicago World's Fair of 1893. But on the zone, just beyond uh, Ghirardelli's and Welch's, all pretense to elegance ended, and a wonderful assembly of styles and tastes and experiences began. But that is another story, and, and Glenn Cuck gives a wonderful talk about the zone. Um, here we see the Mexican Tuatec village, the Alt Nuremberg, a German restaurant that still showed up despite the beginnings of the war, and the Chinese pagoda from the Chinese village. There were also uh, faster food stands on the zone. This proud owner is offering drinks, frankfurters, and banana splits. And with that, I'll close with just a few finishing facts for you to read regarding the, um, the total revenues on the left. And notice there was a profit of 1312000 uh, which is roughly $30 million in today's uh, dollars, and uh, was open only 287 days, but there were 18 million visitors. Admission prices were 50 cents for adults, but that was $11.78 today, and children were 25 cents, about 5.89. But then they had to pay for the uh, different um, 
experiences, too. They had to buy tickets for those. So I want to thank a few people. Um, private collector Glenn Cuck, who's here, and Oakland Ephemera dealers uh, Pat and Jeff Carr, who are sitting next to him back in the middle there, and also private collector uh, Pat Monaco, who couldn't be here tonight. Uh, that's a photo of her in the middle uh, in Afghanistan in 1980, in 1970, excuse me. Um, they helped so much with giving me access to all those wonderful images, and I thank you all. That was, that was great, Pam. Thank you. Uh, and next, we're going to hear from Jeanette Ferrari, uh, the author of MFK Fisher and Me, A Memoir of Food and Friendship, Out of the Kitchen, Adventures of a Food Writer, and the California America, American, the Californian, sorry, the California American Cookbook. Jeanette has written widely about food, restaurants, books, and personalities for the New York Times, as well as many other publications. She teaches food writing and is also a gifted photographer. There's an exhibit of her, foot, of her photography project called Eating Alone, which uh, combines her food and photography interests, and that'll be opening in January at the City Arts of San Mateo Gallery. Welcome, Jeanette. So I'm, I'm, I'm the shortest one. I was elected shortest speaker. Um, so I have to admit that I got interested in the Panama Pacific International Exposition somewhat prematurely because uh, somewhere in the, eight, in the 70s, I was doing um, research for my uh, first book, the California American Cookbook, and I was really looking for um, cul California culinary history, and it was before Erica wrote her book, so there was no chance of getting anything like that. And of course, it was way before any thoughts of centennials because it was in the 70s. Um, but uh, I discovered this fantastic uh, trove of information in a five-volume series at the San Mateo Library that was called The Story of the Exposition uh, by Frank Morton Todd. And um, it, was, it was totally fascinating as a crystallization of what was going on in all uh, aspects of food in California in 1915. And, I, and, I, and it was just a wonderful uh, thing to, to be able to find all of this information in this five volumes, and I kept taking notes like, you know, all over the place, which I still have. Um, but um, what was surprising was that the more I found out, the more familiar it began to sound, and I realized that actually the PPIE was basically an earlier vo version of the gourmet ghetto, <laughs> which is what was going on at the time. Um, you know, the gourmet ghetto of Chez Panisse and, and uh, Pete's and the uh, cheese board and Coco Lod and all those places that were was so exciting going on uh, at that time. Uh, and then I found that Todd's description of the Palace of Food Products might have been Shattuck Avenue. He said, cooking and eating were going on all about from the time the doors were opened until they closed and odors filled the air that seemed to rob people of reason. Probably there was not a second of the day throughout the exposition season when somebody was not eating something in this palace. Um, he said, uh, when you think about it, there are few things more important than food, and it is well to spread all possible knowledge of it. And finally, he said, after all is said and done, the menu is the main aim of agriculture. So... Um, this is not just the verdict of a local person because um, there was a writer from Philadelphia who came and he wrote about the remarkable food in California and he said, in California, the Epicureans are not the favored few, but the great democracy. So that also sort of resonated with the sort of delicious revolution, you know, of the, of the uh, gourmet ghetto era and the... Uh, eating is a political act and all that kind of thing, you know. But there were actually very specific similarities between the gourmet ghetto and, uh, 
and uh, the um, PPIE, such as the discovery of uh, good uh, coffee way before uh, Alfred Peetz opened his place in the, in the 60s. The Guatemalans uh, had a huge uh, exhibit and it was considered the most attended foreign exposition of the entire fair. Um, possibly that was because they gave away 50,000 packs of coffee, but um, it was also, coffee was of great interest and uh, the Hill, Hills Brothers and MJB and um, um, Folgers also had <coughs> booths and um, exhibits. Uh, Folgers, uh, in a little bit of modern merchandising, gave away coupons for 10 cents off their coffee, and their rationale was that our object is to show the difference between 45-cent coffee and the cheaper grades. So that's a pound. <laughs> 45 cents. It's not a, a quarter of a teaspoonful like you would get today for that amount. <clears throat> Cheese was a big revelation, literally. Um, uh, you saw that picture uh, at the New York exhibit, which was considered the biggest single, solid, homogeneous, and self-supporting cheese ever built in the world. <laughs> I don't know how many other self-supporting cheeses were built in the world. But uh, it was described as a hill of, a hill of nutriment that was uh, 78 and a half inches in diameter and stood almost five feet high. It was made of 150,000 pounds of milk, the yield of 10,000 cows, uh, 375 pounds of salt, and perhaps most tellingly, one and a half gallons of carrot coloring material. So you think that's new. It isn't. <laughs> um, speeches were made from the top of it. And, um, <laughs> and uh, pieces uh, were sold. They were cut with piano wire at uh, 25 cents a pound. But I think the most interesting thing about this, this whole exhibit was that the, although the cheese was made in, in New York, and you've heard about <laughs> how it got here, um, it, was, uh, it ripened in California, and the consensus was that it ripened better in California, and that this indicated that a combination of New York and California would be some state. <laughs> so we're still waiting for that. Um, and then there's the breads, which again, um, Pam uh, showed the Sperry uh, Flour Company and that they did demonstrations of all kinds of breads, including matzahs and tortillas and uh, Chinese novelties and sourdough and all kinds of things like that. The Quaker Oats Company uh, had scones, and scones, um, <laughs> which you'll be able to taste, were so popular that uh, it was said that the noon rush at this corner was dangerous to life and limb. Hopefully we'll have enough tonight so we won't have any of those problems. Um, and then this demonstration of the mechanical bread breaking, uh, which included uh, wrapping of the breads. Um, and this was um, considered, actually, <clears throat> there was a lot of respect for all kinds of mechanization and things that were done by machine. and. Uh, it, one of the characterizations of this was that it was a convincing demonstration of the superiority of the mechanical handling of food, and it helped a good many people understand that mechanical processes almost always give better results than hand work. <laughs> um, in fact, the fascination with bread production and other kinds of mechanization may, may have been more of a foreshadowing of Silicon Valley than, um, than the gourmet ghetto. Um, and some of these things that were shown there were the egg hatcher, uh, incubator, a beet topper that did the work of five men, and potato diggers and uh, cider presses. Um, machinery that cleaned and trimmed the salmon was called with an unfortunate sort of racist tinge, the iron chink, because it took the place of many Chinamen. So that was the, the characterization of that. Um, 
In fact, it said the, the, disfa this, the disfavor in which the poor old human hand had fallen after preparing our food for us for so many years was noteworthy and somewhat pathetic throughout the palace of food products. Um, the, um, there was a great respect for the art of uh, canning as one of the greatest blessings mankind ever bestowed on itself. That canned food should be under any unjust suspicion is a loss, direct or indirect, to everybody that eats, Todd said. And now one of the favorite desserts there was called Peacherino, and it was canned peaches uh, pressed against um, peach ice cream or, or uh, vanilla ice cream. So aside from that kind of um, presaging of what goes on now in terms of uh, mechanization, um, the um, people who are uh, starting things like Munchery and Blue Apron and uh, Mark Bittman's whatever, Purple Carrot, whatever he's calling it, might, have been, might be surprised to know that, the, that home delivery was something that was demonstrated there. And uh, a day, uh, there was a day called Grocery Day, and they demonstrated a system whereby shops would take uh, orders over the telephone, this is in 1915, and wrap up the prunes and sugar and bacon in just the quantity desired and send them to the kitchen door by a delivery service. Thus, people will have things to eat on hand when they are wanted that give variety to diet and rest to the housewife. <laughs> so, um, there was also a, um, there was a lot of attention paid to uh, the innovators themselves, to, to, to people. There was a certain kind of cult of personality uh, that had its own heroes and heroines. And um, let's start with the heroines. Actually, there's only one that I found, but um, her name was uh, Mrs. Frida Amen uh, of Oroville. And she was uh, um, praised as the woman who taught the world to eat ripe olives and thus conferred a new sort of food on at least part of mankind. She was considered the mother of the California olive industry and she was the woman who got uh, people to break the old Spanish green olive habit, as it was called. <laughs> and she put black olives into many of the world's restaurants, starting with the Palace Hotel. So she actually, um, actually made um, uh, farming of uh, the agriculture of black olives um, brought it back into being a viable um, uh, 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 occupation again. Um, there was even a California Ripe Olive Day uh, during which admirers of the olive started a movement to have the olive uh, replace the dove as the symbol of peace. So a lot of respect for that. Uh, <laughs> then there was Mackie B. Wallace who uh, invented the Wallace egg carrier. And he was really greatly praised for vanquishing the, uh, the chicken in these, in these words, it said, for as long as man has fussed with the embodiment of primordial stupidity, the domesticated hen, for as long as he has hatched her and brooded her and kept her warm nights and fed her fancy chicken feed and given her a good roost and a soft nest and cured her of the pip and kept the coyotes and skunks away from her, there has been no improvement whatever in the shape of the hen's egg. <laughs> it still comes without handles and of a form that will fit nothing else in the world nor stack nor pack economically with others of its kind. So you can see that this uh, Wallace egg carrier, which was basically like an egg carton, um, was a tremendous improvement. He also, uh, thanks to showing this at the fair, uh, attracted the attention of light bulb um, makers, and so they adopted some form of the egg carrier to uh, transport uh, light bulbs as well. Then there's the strawberry man. His name was Albert Edder, and he um, grew uh, all kinds of new varieties of 
uh, strawberries, um, and uh, that the strawberries were a huge, big a draw, um, and uh, people just loved um, tasting all these strawberries. He had 26 varieties, um, and one of the species <clears throat> that he did, which was produced by crossing two um, wild non-edible varieties, resulted in a pungent woodsy flavor, a fruit which steaming from between two broad hot slabs of butter-soaked biscuit dough would make the average American family forget the mortgage and all the world besides. So new and unusual ingredients that were objects of fascinated, fascination including, included things like marshmallows, and uh, they, they were featured in a uh, marshmallow eating contest for young ladies, as they called it. Um, there was uh, sake, which was served in silver cups at the groundbreaking of the Japan, uh, Japan Beautiful, their exhibit was called. There were enchiladas, tamales, chili con carne, and other torrid forms of sustenance, as it was described. The, uh, t the t Louisiana exhibit included Tabasco, um, which was described as tasting so interesting and feeling like a spoonful of fresh cooked lava. <laughs> um, and then there was canned salmon, which again will be one of the things that we'll be tasting uh, tonight. Um, the canned salmon, there were 5,000 cans of canned salmon were given away there, and the canned salmon was served by four mermaids. So I don't know if the mermaids have arrived, but we'll, we'll see when we, we get out there. <laughs> uh, on closing day, the uh, crowds devoured four and a half tons of that convenient little food cartridge, the Frankfurter sausage. Um, so speaking of closing day, I'd like to close with this Frank Morton Todd's summary of the uh, fair's significance. He said, that expositions are the swift, efficient organizers of the industry of the world. They, they help the world find itself. They show it what it has, what it thinks, what it is doing. And they show it what it needs and how it can get it. Their service in raising human efficiency is invaluable. They make history over, and they do it right in the exhibit palaces where one art helps another. That organizing process went on at San Francisco for 288 days. With what effect in its entirety, we shall never know, because that effect in its entirety is too large for us ever to see. It is broadening out all about us today, and will go on broadening out until its farthest ripples are merged and lost in the ocean of human activity. This is the significance of the exhibits. So, here you go. <laughs> Thank you, Jeanette. And uh, our last speaker tonight is Julia Lavaroni. She is the grandniece of Harold Paul, who was the longtime owner of Laraburu Brothers Bakery. And Julia is currently producing a film on San Francisco's iconic Laraburu bread. Um, the bread won first place at the PPIE, so that's uh, why she's here to speak. And we will, at the end, see a teaser for that film, I believe. Welcome, Julia. Thank you. you know what? I did have a picture of the silver cup that I sent, and I didn't test it before you guys all got here. So I'm not sure that we have it on, probably not. All right, that's fine. You guys will have to imagine the silver cup. Um, my uncle, Hal Paul Sr., owned Larabrew Brothers. Oh, sorry. Uh, he owned Larabrew Brothers from 1946 to 1976. Uh, and I'm here to talk to you a little bit about the early years of Larabrew before my, uh, my cousins, the Pauls, had it. And I have a really cute story for you about the PPIE, uh, the win uh, at the uh, Baker's Day competition. Um, but I'm also here to talk to you a little bit about a personal journey that I've been on. Uh, I was 13 in 1976. 
I, have, I was old enough to have developed a very strong taste memory of the bread. Uh, was not really paying attention to the drama around uh, the, the bankruptcy. I don't know how many of you guys remember Lara Baru. Does, does anybody know? Yes, kind of? Okay. So hopefully, I'm going to go fast, but hopefully you know something about uh, the accident and uh, the lawsuit. Um, if you don't, we'll, we'll, it's, it'll be a little bit in the, in the, <laughs> in the, in the teaser. Um, when we stopped getting the bread, that's when it hit me, that there was something really wrong. Um, my taste memory was so strong that nothing that my family served in its place uh, tasted right. And so that's when uh, I started asking questions. Mostly it was a, you know, a 13-year-old pestering her grandparents, you know, where's the bread? Where's un what's out Uncle Hal doing? You know, just bake the bread. Um, and nobody really knew what was going on with, with, uh, with the bread. And then the years passed, and I clearly wasn't getting any answers from my family, and it became obvious that Lara Baru was gone, that we weren't ever going to get Lara Baru back. And then the internet came along, and so I started Googling, and uh, I was surprised. I really expected just to hear, uh, just to find historical information, uh, just for myself, but this is now 30 37 years later, I started seeing uh, people talking about Lara Baru, still talking, trying to recreate the flavor. There's bread blogs out there. They were all exchanging recipes and, and tips, and they weren't quite getting the flavor right, and so they were also asking, where is Lara Baru? Where's the starter? So there were people out there, just like me, curious about what had happened to the bread. And then a year and a half ago, I typed Lara Brew into my Google browser, and I got a new hit. It was uh, an article by Mary Margaret Pack. She was writing for Austin Edible Magazine, and she was interviewing an Austin, Texas baker. Uh, uh, sorry, an Austin, Texas chef. His name was Ben Baker, and he was being interviewed for his sourdough bread. And he gave all of the credit to the success of that bread, to the fact that he was using the Larabaru starter. Well, this was crazy, right? I mean, it's been 37 years. I've been looking for this starter forever. My family doesn't even know where it is. And this 30-year-old, by the look of his picture, is saying he's got it. And he wasn't alive in 1976. And he was in Austin, Texas. You don't make sourdough bread in Austin, Texas. You just don't, right? So I thought he was lying, um, but I had to email him. And so I did, and he got back to me the very next day. And he was super excited to hear from me. He said that he had been given the starter by a mentor of his when they worked together in Hawaii. And that his mentor, whose name was Scott, was very secretive about his sourdough and very protective. And so Ben didn't really know much about where Scott had got the starter, but he was convinced that Scott was telling the truth. And he was so convinced that he invited me to come to Austin and that he would bake the bread for me. And so I could taste it for myself. And in the meantime, he would contact Scott, who lived off the grid on Haleakala in Maui and baked bread in a solar oven and still had the, the, the sourdough. He, he was sure he still had the sourdough starter, and he would try to find out more information for me. Okay. So this is a crazy story, right? And, but I needed, to, I needed to follow through. I had to go to Austin. And so I emailed a friend of mine named uh, Kirk Fuller, who's a videographer, and he is with us tonight. He, uh, I told him that this could be a crazy, cool story. It could be a complete bust. And he was willing to take the chance and come with me. And so we went, and uh, Scott 
flew from Hawaii to Austin to meet us, which was a good sign. And it took some, uh, it took some prodding, but we got the story out of him. And it is a really cool story. So we are doing a documentary. Um, and even though that we're not finished, uh, we're not finished filming, uh, Kirk has put together a teaser for us of the work that we've done so far, and we're going to play that in, uh, in just a couple minutes. Okay. Now for the part about the PPIE. Um, John and St. John Larabaru were, were Basque. They were from the Basque region of France, and they came to San Francisco in the year 1900. Now their family, uh, they weren't bakers, they raised sheep, as did most everybody in the Basque region of France. But they had a sourdough starter, a family sourdough starter. And the boys brought that starter with them to San Francisco. Now it wasn't a coincidence that they came to San Francisco. San Francisco at the time was very French. It had a large French immigrant population. Um, there were a lot of French laundries, and a lot of French bakeries. And when the boys got here, they met and married uh, French immigrant sisters named Marie and Louise Tesario. And the Tesario family had one of those French bakeries. It was out on the avenues, uh, I think third in Geary. And the couples now married decided that that would be their livelihood. And so they bought out the Tesario parents and used their bakery, which is called New Parisian at the time, but they, uh, they substituted in the Larabaru starter. Okay, so New Parisian, but Larabaru starter. And they, I think they appended the name. It became Larabaru Brothers New Parisian. Now something else really curious happens at this time. We start hearing reports of a sour bread coming out of San Francisco. This was not heard of anywhere else. This was before the time of uh, baker's yeast. So if you baked, whether you were baking uh, at home or, or commercially, you baked with a sourdough starter. And it was called a sourdough starter. But the bread that you baked was never sour. So this was a San Francisco phenomenon. I can't definitively connect these reports that start happening around 1901, 1902, uh, with the Larabaru starter, but the timing is compelling. It's definitely worth following up on. <laughs> um, and we do know that the Larabaru brothers produced a sour loaf. So still a little bit of a mystery, but uh, worth mentioning. 1915 comes along. The PPIE is coming to town. Everybody's super excited. They announce a Baker's Day competition. And all of the French bakeries in San Francisco are going to submit a loaf. Now, the Larabaru brothers were, were particularly sentimental about their loaf. They wanted everybody in the bakery to feel like they were a part of this really exciting time. So it didn't matter whether you were a baker or um, you worked in the back office or if you were a delivery boy, everybody who worked there had physical hands on that loaf. So they were either punching it down or kneading it or shaping it or whatever it was, they all physically touched the loaf that they then baked and submitted for, uh, for judging. And that way they could say, if they won, that they had all had a hand in baking the winning loaf which I think is a really charming story. And they did win. Um, I wish I had the picture. <laughs> Actually, my cousins still have the uh, silver cup. Um, it says uh, Baker's Day competition, a PPIE. It gives the date. I think it was June 29th, 1915. First prize awarded to New Parisian. They were still using New Parisian. After this... It was all about Larabaru brothers. They dropped New Parisian and they became, they became Larabaru brothers. Uh, now, fast forward back to 1976. Um, it's changed hands. The Larabaru brothers no longer have it. My, my cousins, the Pauls, have it. 
It has become a San Francisco phenomenon. Those of you who were um, around back then remember the name probably. It defined the, the, the flavor of, of San Francisco, traditional San Francisco sourdough. It was sold in every state of the United States. It was sold in France. It was sold in England. It was sold in, I think, Amsterdam. It was sold in Asia. It was everywhere. Um, and sales were strong. And it collapsed. Uh, most people think that it was the accident. There was a terrible accident. We'll go into that in the film. Um, and the lawsuit. That's not completely true. But just suffice it to say that there was a bankruptcy and a liquidation. Um, my uncle sold everything except uh, some California State Fair medals. He kept those. He kept the cup, the PPIE cup, uh, and he kept the starter. He never sold the starter. He always intended to bring Larabaru back. This was his life. Um, I think he'd worked there since he was 13. He started as a driver. And when the Larabaru brothers and their wives uh, never had children and had nobody to leave it to, they asked my uncle if he would like to take it over, and he did. So uh, he was devastated when they had to sell, and he was absolutely determined to bring it back. So to prepare for that, he took the starter and he divided it into five sections. And he, so, he, not sold, he sent each one of the five sections to a cold storage facility. And he waited for this lawsuit that he was going to win and he was going to start over. He lost the lawsuit. And he only had the one chance. And uh, he died shortly after this. He never left provisions for the starter. Nobody knew where it was. It's why all of those years that I was pestering my, my grandmother and my parents, nobody had any idea. It's because they really didn't. Um, and nobody was paying any bills. So they likely got tossed. The thing is, flash freezing is a really intense process. And a starter is a living organism. So the likelihood of, that, of any of those starters surviving was small. So that could have been the end of the story, except for this email with Ben Baker saying, come to Austin and let me bake the bread for you. So that's where I'm going to leave it. Somebody is going to play the teaser. Um, I will say we are still, um, we're still filming. We have a lot of filming left to do. Uh, and we're on Facebook. So if you have a Facebook account, please find us, Larabaru Brothers Bakery, um, and tell us your personal stories. I know there are people out there who stole the bread off the racks um, when it was cooling. <laughs> um, and we want to hear those stories. So please, um, please visit us there. And I hope that you enjoy Kirk's work. Thanks. When people think about food and San Francisco, they think about sourdough bread. That happened because of bakeries like Lara Brew. One of the first things that came to mind in San Francisco was La Rue La Rue was a name at that time. French bakery on 3rd Avenue in the Richmond district. So I used to stop by the actual bakery and pick up warm loaves of bread. It was renowned in the city, right? It was at the chef's table, uh, all over Fisherman's yeah, Wharf, Al Yoto's. For natives, I mean, we're Larabru people, Swan Oyster Depot, Freed Taylor and Freed Coffee. You can't touch them. I missed the bread. I'd, I've missed it for years. And I wanted to learn more about it. And a child was injured by a Larabaru truck and they were suing for millions of dollars. Because of the newsworthiness of the large award, as when it hit the papers, uh, their creditors suddenly called a number of the loans, weren't extending credit to them anymore, and that forced them to uh, close. Hi! <laughs> 
Thanks, Are you a hugger? Yeah, I'm, I'm a, a hugger. hugger. Oh, thank you. <gasps> nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. You're the mystery man. And who would have thought that sourdough bread, which is such a San Francisco tradition, I mean, it's iconic in San Francisco, would have such a following in Austin, Texas. We are in your kitchen in Travassa, and yeah. you are going to take us through the process of making your Mixing the sourdough. sourdough. Yeah. My father-in-law and David discussed that, well, it'd be kind of nice to get sourdough started here in Portland. The Lair Brew Bakery said yes, that they would give him a start, but that they would, he would probably not be able to get the same flavor and the same kind of sourdough. Little pieces of history, I think they're important. And especially this one, because it Sourdough bread is so synonymous with San Francisco. To find the bread, the flavor that epitomized that, um, I think that's important. So I've been told that we don't have very much time and we do have some delicious food for you. So we're not going to take questions formally here, but we, the four of us, are um, hanging out. We'll eat, we'll drink, we'll talk with you and answer your questions more informally. So thank you very much for coming tonight and the food is right that way.